Hello and welcome back to the Wisdom Factory. Conversations that matter and they really do matter because we have so many conflicts in our world and nowadays and we want to talk about evolutionary development of our identity with conflict. And our guest today is Patrick Cassidy, who I got to know uh, in a similar presentation and I found it so amazing and so unusual how you frame that. So I invited you to talk with me about it because I want to learn and I think my audience, our audience wants to learn too. No. So uh, thank you that you are with us, with me in this case here and um, welcome. And I give over to you and you might say some words about you and where you come from, your background and whatever you think it's important before we enter into the topic. Okay, great. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, my, like you said, my name is, is Patrick Cassidy, and I've, uh, I've been um, involved in the art of Aikido for, uh, for over 35 years and um, started uh, and have been involved in martial arts training since the age of seven. So it's been a long, um, a long practice for me. And, um, and the theme, obviously, in martial arts is, is how we face conflict and how we deal with conflict at the physical level. And um, so uh, my history has been um, seven years, almost seven years living in Japan, fully committed to, to learning the art of Aikido, uh, along with um, uh, a deep commitment to meditation and yoga and, uh, and the art of uh, Japanese tea ceremony. Um, I started that soon after I had arrived in Japan. It became a parallel practice for me along with Aikido while I was living there. I found it as a good balance for the, the, energetic, the energetic qualities of the practice that, uh, that came in the art. So. I could talk more about that, but that's not why we're here. So I'll skip on to something else. And it, after leaving Japan, I, I moved into working as a, a full-time uh, Aikido teacher, uh, facilitator, uh, opening a dojo in California, in Fresno, California, and I, which I ran for seven years. And um, at the end of that, I passed on my school to my senior students and I moved uh, at that time with my, my partner, uh, Dominique, to Switzerland, where we had started a, um, a new dojo here in Montreux. And, um, and I've been running this dojo for the last uh, almost 14 years. And, um, and uh, I've since then, have been lucky enough and grateful enough to work with other Aikido teachers, some of who have, have uh, grown out of my Uchideshi program. And I'm currently supervising and, and leading a, a group of Aikido schools uh, under the banner Evolutionary Aikido Community. And the reason we say evolutionary is based on the idea that Aikido, specifically Aikido, but I think many different arts, yoga, meditation, and, and in any, actually any practice that you take, can lead to uh, a catalyst for human evolution. And human evolution meaning the development, not only the, the developmental part of, of human growth and, and, and realizing human potential, um, but I think evolution leads, uh, the evolutionary movement comes out of the human potential movement that was, uh, that really emerged in the 70s, uh, early, late 60s and, and 70s. And because I think it, it looks at not only the human developmental component, but also the spiritual awakening or, or um, the process of of discovering the uh, 
an individual's um, ground of being or their Buddha nature, so to speak. And these, this marrying of, of awakening and development is not necessarily a you know, radically new um, theme. It's, it's, it's mirrored in many different approaches in, in Asia and in certain, in certain aspects of Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism and in Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga perspective and, uh, and certain, um, certain approaches uh, in, in ancient spirituality included the human evolutionary aspect to a, to a certain degree. But I feel like uh, specifically now, as, as we are coming into terms at, the, at, the, uh, at, our, at our cultural and, and global consciousness, that we are, are, we are evolving, we are facing some very challenging situations which are stimulating evolution as evolution is often stimulated by crisis, that we are at a point where we can actually start to choose the direction we want to evolve into. And this is a, a theme and a, and a concept which I think is, is to a large degree really rather new, just something emerging in the last 20 to 30 years. And I think that the, the question on how we evolve out of a, a spiritual understanding of who we are at the, at, the, at the depth of our being and how we evolve as human individuals, how we evolve also, also as, uh, as social structures, as culture, and finally at the global level of our, of our humanity is a very important question. Yeah. And, so that's kind of what my what draws and what inspires me and and what is the fundamental uh, reason for this map that we'd like to, that that I'm going to share with you today and, and, and the topic that we're going to discuss. Yeah, because I, I'm for more than twenty years I'm a follower of Ken Wilber and his mm -hmm. integral maps and mm -hmm. also spiral dynamics. They have a right. sort of the same. A um, bit different uh, evolutionary uh, model uh, yes. in colors and uh, yeah, and these are all models and yes. they make sense. Yeah. And uh, as I had done a little bit of Aikido, uh, mm. and I, I found that always a discipline with everybody should learn from childhood on. And I, I'm hearing that you have done that. That's that's mm. really great. That should be taught in school, from, mm. in, in my opinion, and not all much of the stuff which you never need. So um, I found it especially um, inspiring how you named the levels of development because mm -hmm. so far we have colors. It is nice in some way, but it doesn't really make any sense when somebody mm -hmm. says magenta or yellow or something. It's just a color. Mm -hmm. And you, with your uh, levels of developmental names, evoke uh, an image and that's mm. what inspired me so much and that's mm. why I, I wanted to talk to you about mm. that and mm. bring it a little bit into the awareness because I'm also having a, a group of, of people where we do chats, integral mm. chat it is called, and we were talking about the levels of development so I would like to bring that in then too, you know, so. Sure, absolutely. Can we start? Yes, yes. <laughs> So I think the, the, if we're looking at um, our identity and basically our, our relationship to the experience of conflict, um, at the ground level, um, we, could, we could call that first primary uh, relationship with conflict at the early stages of, of life as being the, 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 the region of the survivor. That in conflict, uh, conflict was um, was a question um, that you know when I experience conflict, or if we imagine our experience ourselves, our early ancestors experiencing conflict, um, that that conflict oftentimes was was measured as a, a life or death situation that the question of conflict, the primary question of conflict is, is um, whether I'm going to survive. And so this first region of conflict I, I name is being the region of the survivor. 
that the primary purpose of, of anything that I'm going to do within conflict is to make sure that I survive. And that, that this, um, that the question, obviously the question that drives me at this level of my being is do I live or do I die? And, um, and, and this is understandable. This is the way, this is uh, the fundamental base ground of, of life. The life impulse is, uh, is that impulse to survive, that impulse to, to live on. And, um, and it's, an, it's an important one. It's not something, it's obviously without that we, we can't function. And, um, and as we move on to these, to these higher, maybe these higher levels or more distinct, uh, more subtle interpretations of conflict, that is the, the, the fundamental ground of conflict. And, um, and one that, that has to be recognized and honored. So that's a fairly, that's, that's one that's, that's fairly easy to, to recognize in, in the sense that it's still, it still operates within us and it's still part of our lives. Yeah, a question I have, uh, when you are attacked uh, by somebody, hmm. then uh, you, you need to survive and that, that would be that you would call then you are in this survivor state? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think that's the, 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 the drive or the impulse that's coming up at that moment is being driven by the survivor state. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, if we were to take, that, to take that circle and then create a, a larger circle that uh, the way I map this out to create a larger circle that encompassed the survivor, the survivor region, and we were to, to uh, identify this region as being the next step out of the survival region. Because if I meet all conflict, if I meet all conflict at the survival region, then all conflict is, is navigated either by living or dying, which is actually quite, uh, that's, that's too much for our systems. If every conflict has to be a conflict where one person has to die in order for the conflict to be solved, then we're living in, in, in an incredibly animalistic uh, nature. And even animals don't, don't resolve all conflict at that level, although the survival, survival level is predominant in, in, in their questioning, there is possibilities of relating to conflict in a slightly different way. And that larger circle that you know, encompasses the survival, survivor, survivor circle is the circle of conflict that we evolved into that allowed us to navigate or, or, or deal with conflict in a way which was bigger than just either um, living or dying. And, and this circle I call the region of the fighter. And the fighter uh, the region of the fighter is dictated um, in a different, with a different value structure, and that value structure is is one of either um, winning or losing. And so, for the fighter, the question is not live or die, but the question is, do I win or do I lose? And um, and this then gives birth to the possibility of of um, sports, the possibility of competition, the possibility of navigating conflict through some form of contest of skill allows us to, to, to deal with conflict um, and resolve conflict without getting, uh, going all the way into a life or death situation, which is a very important evolutionary step. And that's something that that humans, early humans, uh, accessed and you know gave birth to the Olympics, uh, for example, which was a way of navigating conflict rather than warfare. To be able to channel these energies in creative, to a certain degree, creative ways, um, rather than simply simply life or death struggles. And so this is a very important step that we took as human beings. That's actually what Don Beck uh, did and Lauren uh, Laubsche in South Africa mm -hmm. to prevent a uh, civil war at the end of the apartheid. Mm -hmm. I just come from the integral conference in Africa and, oh, wow. and, and learned a lot uh, about that. And mm. 
it is a real step up that yes. you can avoid war by placing it into the stadium. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it channels, it channels energies. There was a, an interesting study, I, I'll try to make it short, where they, they, did, a, they did a study on, on, on rats and rats who received trauma Rats who received trauma through, uh, through some form of uh, electrical stimulus or something like this, if the rats could somehow ha given an avenue to release their trauma by biting or attacking another rat, the, the trauma that the, the, the initial rat received didn't later on develop into um, cancer or some form of tumors. If the rat did not have an opportunity to pass on the trauma to another rat, that rat would develop cancer or tumors. And to a large extent, uh, um, the ability to compete or the ability to fight or the ability to wage conflict in that way, to a certain degree, allows us to process trauma in creative ways rather than, um, than fundamentally absorb the trauma within our you know, psychophysiological structure and, and have no outlet for, for channeling that trauma in, in creative fashions. And that's an important thing to recognize that these things do allow us to, to process trauma, but they have to be nuanced in a way that allows us to understand what we're doing as well, not just as automatic, um, you know, somebody abuses me, I abuse somebody else, so then I feel better. Because mm -hmm. then there's no actual fundamental processing of trauma in a creative fashion, it just becomes passed on. Yeah. Which, to a large extent, is the way we've been, the way we've been, we've been dealing with conflict in such a long, for such a long time, that has a tendency to pass down generations. Absolutely, that, and we are still doing it. Exactly, there is no consciousness about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So if we move beyond, so, so the first circle is the circle of the survivor and the question of life, life or death. Do I live or do I die? The second circle is the is the region of the fighter and the and the question now is do i win or do i lose now the the value structure of the fighter can sometimes even take precedence or priority over the value structure of the survivor in the sense that you could imagine uh, uh, and it's there there are documented uh, cases of this but uh, uh, somebody, let's say a marathon runner in the Olympics, running and, and getting all the way to the end and finally crossing the finish line and then boom, landing and, and dying of a heart attack and giving their whole, you know, their whole, their whole system was so committed to winning and achieving that goal, it overrode, it overrode their survivor, survival instinct. And then they, they, they achieve the goal, but at the sacrifice of their own life. And culturally, we could even imagine that culture would honor somebody who had done something like that. Absolutely. And I think it's also normal for parents, what they do for their children when they yeah. have a serious problem, that they would yeah. uh, sacrifice their own life for, for right. that. At least that is the sure. normal human way of doing. Right. Yeah. Or in, in, in oftentimes in, in competitions and, and in, in development of, of, of skills at a certain level, we often override our own health yes. in order to achieve skills. And that's a, that's a, that can be a very problematic uh, negative loop if we're not aware of the need at the survival level of basically the fundamental health of our being. So as we move into competition, if the competition starts to starts to engage, and this is where the we start to move into um, the needs, not just the needs of our of our physical health, but of the needs of our psychological or our personal narrative, our ego, or the health of our ego, as we engage in competition and become uh, attached to the idea of being a winner or needing to win, that, psycho that psychological need or that egoic kind of attachment can override the survival instinct of the physical system in, in many different ways. But that's, that's a whole nother 
a whole other area to travel into, but let's let's maybe perhaps move on just in case. Uh, yeah, it just came a, a question to me. So sure. ego expression would be a, a fighter, ego equalizing the fighter level? No, the, an egoic a fighter, uh, 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 the, that region is just working on the question of moving the, the value structure, in, moving our relationship, our identity with conflict into another area where we can determine conflict, we can navigate conflict um, through a, a question of winning or losing through a sporting event or something like that. Now, at this point in time, the ego can enter in because the ego can fundamentally see, well, I have a place to identify with in a very strong way as being successful or a winner. It's, it, it doesn't necessarily, I can imagine, you know, that there are sporting athletes or those people who involve the competition who aren't predominantly driven by the ego. But oftentimes, um, you know, identifying as a winner or being the, the, the one who's successful is a place for the ego to really, uh, to really take a certain kind of identity with in a very strong fashion. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where, that's another question of, of relating, to, uh, relating to conflict because as the needs, as we develop the needs, of, of dealing with conflict, we have to recognize that we're not only dealing with conflict at the physical, the, uh, as our physical nature, but we're also dealing with the conflict as a way to protect our self-identity, that we're protecting our, our self-image, protecting our, our narrative, protecting our story, protecting the, the story we have around our culture, because oftentimes much of con what conflict uh, is, is experienced is, is not necessarily protecting our, 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 physical, our physical life, but actually protecting the story around our, our life and, and, and protecting our identity as a culture, protecting our identity as a, as a, as a, as a nation or, or, or in some level, you know, identifying at that level with a larger, a larger kind of narrative that is actually not, not truly associated with our own physical health. It, yes. In many ways, we can, it could be contrary to the needs of our physical health. And that's, that's what we are doing now. Yeah, yeah, to a large extent, yes. Yeah, exactly. So as we move uh, from the first circle survivor to the second circle fighter, we could move into the third circle, which surrounds the fighter circle. And this is an evolution of the fighter into a region known as the soldier. And um, now the soldier is, is driven by a different value structure. The soldier is driven by, it goes beyond just the needing to win, but uh, it encapsulates or incorporates the concepts of doing, uh, being part of a larger structure that that larger structure, that I identify with that larger structure, and I fit in that larger structure. And when I fit in that larger structure, and when I identify with that larger structure, I become, I become connected with the power of that structure. So in history, um, for example, when Rome invaded the plains of Europe, it moved into this region where, where most of the the, the Celtic tribes, the, 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 the local tribes that were engaged there, were living there, were mostly dealing with conflict at the level of the fighter. And, uh, and, and, and small clans and small tribes um, and dealing with, the, dealing with conflict at that level where, where if there was a conflict, it would be one-on-one, -on -one, it would be dealt with one-on-one. -on -one. And maybe small groups, but still fundamentally enhancing the the esteem of the individual fighter as being the primary as being the primary way you would deal with conflict. And here comes Rome, where they move together as a unit, and each soldier knows its place. Each soldier has its job, and 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 on the plains of the the battlefield one fighter may come up to a line of soldiers and say, okay, come on, you, let's, let's fight. And the, and the individual soldier says, no, I'm not here to fight. I'm here 
to do my job. I'm here to do my job. I'm here to be in the right place at the right time, according to my position. And of course, there, there is combat, but the soldier is more uh, aligned with the question of, is it right or is it wrong? Am I doing the right thing? Am I in the right place? Am I, am I doing what, it, what my duty asks me to do? And so if you have a group of soldiers and they're all in tune with what they need to do and they all fit, and they meet a group of fighters who are all independently wanting to, to, to deal with the conflict, the soldiers, will, the soldiers will, 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 will be much more successful than a group of fighters because they're fundamentally working on a different kind of value structure. And that value structure allows them to do something beyond just the question of winning or losing. A group of soldiers, a small group of soldiers will do something where they know they, they may not win and they know that they may not even survive, but they do it because they know or they have a sense that what they're doing is right for their, for their nation, for their culture, for their, for their, their group. And, and you can, there are many examples again in, in history where a small group of soldiers were protecting one particular area against a massive, a massive uh, force. And they knew they weren't going to survive. They knew they weren't going to win, but they knew what they, they had the idea that what they were doing was right. And so they went ahead and did it. They, they, they found the strength to move forward and, and to hold that line. And in martial arts, specifically, this is uh, along the lines of, um, of Aikido and other martial arts. This is where art forms or martial arts were, were, were organized and systematized into not just, not just fighting arts, but actual, not just fighting techniques, but actual physical art forms where the person would learn uh, physical techniques that were based on tradition, based on, on culture, based on, on beauty, aesthetic sense as well. And they would develop a certain um, attachment to doing the physical art irregardless of whether or not the art would be successful in a competition or not, uh, because they were, they were actually looking for something else than just the question of winning or losing. And so Aikido, to a certain degree, exists, traditional Aikido exists at this level of doing the technique according to the way the teacher tells them to do the technique, not based necessarily on whether the technique would win or lose in a competition. So as far as I know, Aikido is not very old, at least the form which is practiced now, only about 100-something years, no? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, it, I mean, the art originally, the art fundamentally became categorized in the 1940s, but mm. it's, based, it's, based on, it's based on Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, which, which has a much longer history. And, and that art obviously emerged out of a lot of relationship with arts that came out of China and, and predominantly also in India mm -hmm. many, many, many years ago. I'm trying to, to make a sort of a parallel because the mm. soldier sounds very much like blue in a spiral exactly. dynamics. Yes. No? Yes. Yes. I would resonate with that, yes. So, and uh, when did blue really appear? So is there a coincidence with uh, martial arts? I, I don't know if, the, you know, I haven't actually looked at that question because that's an interesting question to, 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 to suggest. But I think the, system is, the systemized approach to, to, to warfare, to conflict, and the techniques that, that went with that, um, martial arts are an example of that, system, uh, that, that systemized approach to, to conflict. But I think Rome is probably a good example of, of how that became a very successful approach. And, um, and, um, but I, would, I, don't have the, I don't have enough information to know whether or not that corresponds with the, um, the blue, the blue, the blue uh, uh, yeah. meme in spiral dynamics and it, how that correlates. And, but that would be an interesting question to, 
Yeah, and the other thing what I wondered is the, this uh, Aikido, how it is practiced now, as you said, that it is not any more important neither to win uh, nor to survive, because you will survive, because uh, it's ritualized and you won't get killed with that. Right. But did that uh, come out of a survivor fight or fighting um, modality that then people at a certain point maybe understood that they could use it for other um, for other things like uh, <laughs> like sport, like mm -hmm. growing skills instead mm -hmm. of uh, winning or uh, even killing the other people. I mean, does that how did it evolve from the lower stages? I think uh, if we look at if we look at the the biography of or Sensei or Morihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido, that he had gone it, even though he was uh, it was a literally a post samurai lifestyle, he was still attached and part of that kind of mindset. And he himself had, had dealt with many, both competitions at the physical level in terms of practicing sumo as a child, but also in many contests which were uh, life-threatening in, in Mongolia and in different areas where he was involved in, in, in actual um, uh, life, you know, life combat where his life was, his life was, uh, was um, being threatened. And um, so he evolved through these stages himself from, from survivor to, to, to fighter to, to soldier. And he had gone through and practiced many of the traditional martial arts of, of that time, including Daito Ryu Aiki Jiu Jitsu. And through a spiritual insight, a recognition of unity and a, and a discovery of his ground of being as being the fundamental context of all life, he, he came to the discovery that I and life are fundamentally one. And this was a radical shift in his consciousness, an enlightenment uh, experience. And that transformed his relationship to conflict. And that transformation for me is represented in the next circle. But what happened in the codification of Aikido after Osensei had his radical enlightenment, his expression of his art, expression of his relationship to conflict became, became Aikido. But as Aikido then got processed and organized, it actually dropped back down to the soldier level. And, uh, and it became organized at the soldier level where these are the proper techniques and all arts in Japan have that kind of mentality, it, whether it's tea ceremony, flower arrangements, kendo, is that uh, adherence to tradition and the strong, strong value structure of doing the technique absolutely correct according to the authority, which is your teacher, and not questioning that. So improvisation, creativity, spontaneity are oftentimes uh, suppressed at the early stages of Japanese art forms as a way for them later on to be, to be, to be recognized when the person becomes a master, when they, when they reach a certain level of, of, of um, transcendence in their art and they can express the art creatively. And that's always been a, a strong model in in in, ja in Japanese in Japanese arts is the fundamental um, is the fundamental uh, adherence to to uh, to their art as being a technical based art one that's in ri or deeply connected to tradition and deeply connected to doing things according to tradition according to the your teacher according to your to your your master and that's where the the that third circle the circle of the soldier the i say or i uh, the way i identify it is that the soldier is defined by the question of doing it right or wrong and according to right or wrong you need uh you need to have some form of uh, uh um some form of hierarchy to determine what that is. Hierarchy determines what is right or wrong. You don't determine that yourself. You, you are 
given those structures by your teachers, by your spiritual leaders, by your culture. And uh, that's where the moral code gets organized. And that's where people become, uh, become strongly conditioned because they become conditioned by the structures of their culture on what is right and what is wrong. And, um, and this is a very important development. It moves us out of just strictly the, the you know, striving for success and moving into a larger sense of, um, of being part of a group and part of that, part of, the, part of the, the whole. And that's a very empowered state when we realize that, that, we, that we have a place in the whole and we can learn how to be, to determine the difference between right and wrong. And um, so that, that is now an, uh, where we, Aikido, if we're gonna make a comment about Aikido, where traditional Aikido has a tendency to be, to be kind of practiced in. At the level of technique, technical, uh, technical skill, doing the technique traditionally right versus uh, wrong is a very important question in, in the world of Aikido right now. And, and we need to, in order to move out to this larger circle where I feel um, is, you know, in a lot of ways, this, these circles also represent or, or mimic, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs to a certain degree. And um, this, this, so we have the, the survivor, the fighter, the soldier, and then beyond the soldier is that movement where the individual says, you know what, I, I need to be able to discover for myself what is my proper response in conflict. I need to go beyond the question of what, my, of what the hierarchy, what my elders tell me is right or, or wrong, but I need to see for myself what is the appropriate response in accordance, not only to, to, to my needs, but the needs of the whole. And, and you're starting to get an individual who's, who's actually wanting to be responsible in a way uh, to take responsibility uh, at the individual level for their actions and, and to go beyond the structures of right and wrong and to go into um, the question of what's the way I refer to it is what's true or what's false. A direct experience of what, um, of what the, the situation or the moment or the conflict needs and to go beyond uh, the structures of right and wrong and even and obviously go beyond the structures of winning or losing to look at the question of how do I solve this conflict in such a way that's true or that some way uh, that I'm able to recognize it directly for myself as, um, as being appropriate or in, in, the, in, in relationship to the, to the moment, in relationship to the system that I live in, in relationship to my own system, in relationship to the relationship I exist in, what is fundamentally true? What is appropriate along those lines? And in order for me to discover that, I have to take responsibility for my actions directly. And this is the level that I refer to is where Osente moved into outside of, you know, beyond his, his studies of martial arts, where, upon his spiritual awakening, that he came into this, this initial movement of the question of what's true or what's false. And this region I refer to, and that's just my choice in, in using this word, but I refer to it as the warrior, as somebody who's becoming independent in their in their discernment, looking at, uh, at, at developing the capacity to, to navigate conflict based on uh, many other different subtle needs other than the, just the question of, you know, what's the right thing to do according to my culture and what's the, what's the, what are the techniques so that I can be, that I can win or, you know, beyond, beyond even just the, the physical needs, what are what is the fundamental important um, needing of the moment, and this is where you would get somebody who would who would uh, be willing to sacrifice their life 
for the sake of another person um, based on their relationship with that person, somebody who would be um, moving towards uh, uh, seeing what the needs of the moment are as being the, the fundamental driver for the response. And, and it requires the person to become, to step out of, of their, it's, they have to start to step out of their own personal narrative in order to be able to come into contact with that. They need to be able to step out of their limited egoic sense. Maybe not necessarily a full-blown um, state of uh, ego, uh, an ego-less or a, an ego-free state of consciousness, but they need to be able to, to access a state which is beyond the needs of their own personal narrative and their own personal, um, personal story. And, uh, and so this is the area that I find um, where Aikido really thrives because it's in relationship. It allows, this is the area that allows for spontaneity. This is the area that allows for um, creativity that emerges in the moment, not creativity that's built upon uh, uh, slow development of technique over, over a long period of time. And that's not a, that's, that type of development is very, very important. It's not bad. But when you get to a certain point, you realize that in order to, to create something uh, authentic, you need to step into a capacity where you're no longer trying to re repeat what is right. The world of right and wrong is a, is a world of repetition. I repeat what is right, and hopefully I become better in, better in my behavior according to my model of what is right and what is wrong. When you move into, into the region of the warrior, you're actually looking and breaking into new ground. You're going beyond what is considered right and wrong. And you're looking, yeah, but in this situation, the structure of what is right, what is right, and what is wrong does not function anymore. So for example, what we're, the fa what we're facing at the global level in terms of climate change and, and the loss of biodiversity, as well as, as social inequality, the, our moral structures based on, on Christianity or, or basic Jude, uh, Christian Judaic uh, perspectives are function, but they're, they've gotten so intertwined with our cultural capitali capitalistic uh, way of seeing life that we are fundamentally still, if you live in that structure of right and wrong, we don't have the skills to deal with this, these systemic challenges that, uh, that face the, the, you know, the, entire, the entire system of our, our entire global system of, of life. And so we need to move outside of traditional models of right and wrong in order to be able to discover new forms, and new ways, new ways of relating to these challenges that are something that we can see uh, and it's not just true, it's not, it's, when I say true or false, I don't necessarily mean just true for me, but true for us, that we face these things that we can recognize, you know, if I want to survive, um, I recognize I live in a system, and that system includes you. And if you, uh, if your fundamental welfare is, is somehow threatened, that has an impact on the system. And if I live in that system and I share that system, that impact has an impact on me. So that logically just ties the fact that we, our welfares are fundamentally tied together, they're linked. And this is a logical deduction based on, on just a recognition of a systemic approach to, to life. Now going into a spiritual realization and a deep recognition that we are fundamentally the fabric of life is one and I am, you know, I am a part of that fabric as much as you are. And at that level, we experience each, each other and the context of our lives as being one fundamental non-separate system. And that's a spiritual realization. But even a logical recognition of a systemic, of a systemic approach to life will bring a person into the desire, into the recognition that we have to go beyond cultural norms in order, to, in order to discover strategies and techniques and responses to the conflicts that we are facing that are appropriate at this next level of our, of our, 
experience. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, it makes totally sense. Before it came to me, um, when you, we talk, talked about that you step up then in this warrior states, mm -hmm. you always uh, refer to conflict. That's your topic. But I was also thinking, for instance, in, in art, in normal yeah. art, uh, music, you yes. first have to learn. You first have to follow the rules. You first have to do the things. And then you can step up and become creative and make it your own, embody it. If you stay in this whole um, thing that you have learned everything very, you, you can, you make sort of pianists, for instance, finger gymnastics, they can be brilliant, but it's not yet real music. So right. until it's not embodied, until you haven't done the step up, uh, it's not, it's not there yet as a, as an art form, as a real art form. No. And I think with what you're saying is, um, the same thing, and we can transfer to many areas of life <clears throat> in in these ways. That Absolutely, and that's a. There's another whole question on 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 the timing of when a person has um, has the the capacity or the skill level or the the moment when they need to make that step up. And oftentimes, the person at the level of the soldier. With regard, if they're if they're doing the techniques that they're musician or artist at some level, they're oftentimes waiting for some form of affirmation or permission from a higher from a higher teacher or uh, uh, another another outside source, whether it's an audience or a teacher or or somebody they refer to with respect, uh, to say, okay, now it's time, you can you can make that creative movement, but actually. That creative step is not something that another person, that's still a, a model out of right and wrong, that somebody has to give me permission to make that step. It's not that way. You make that step when it's time for you to make that step. In certain levels, you have to make that step even before you digest the art form completely in, in being able to actually be, access what I would call that authentic space of, of that desire to want to see things directly for oneself and to be able to create from that recognition and, um, and to move from there. Yeah, absolutely. But only at, uh, with a certain basis you need to have, you can uh, re go back and uh, then learn the skills which, which you haven't learned yet. So yeah, you can first go up and then recover the other skills. But the other way, only staying with this, the skills and not doing the step, it doesn't take you further. Yeah. No? Right, yeah. right. In the example of poetry, for example, if, you, if a person studied poetry and they studied all the different forms of poetry and studied the great poets, at one point in time, do they give themselves permission to write poetry? If they do, if, do they wait until they've amassed a certain amount of information and they've copied and, and are able to repeat and recite great poets before they create their own poetry? Or do they give themselves that space to step into that into that? authentic space and write bad poetry, but it's still actually something that comes from them. And then later on, simultaneously continue to study uh, great, great, great authors, great poets, and, uh, and grow in that kind of technical format of the art as they're continuing to approach this other, other level of, of, of authentic expression in the work that they're doing. Yeah, that's, so that's a big step, a big step, for, uh, especially in cultures as ours who have been dominated so long by the by the soldier state. Let's say yes, that. Right. Can you give yourself the permission to, or right. do you need to wait? Right. <laughs> and, so well, it, and, and ironically, it, in 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 the in the in 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 my original culture, American culture, oftentimes the soldier state is rejected, can be rejected. And people immediately want to go into the creative state without going through any developmental process in order to be able to access uh, an authentic expression. So there can be attempts to kind of jump, to jump or skip uh, levels of development, which then kind of limit the person's capacity to actually um, become authentic. And so there is, these levels are important, just as you, know, as you mentioned, um, the model of uh, spiral dynamics, it's important that culture move through these levels and it's important that individuals move through these levels in order to be able to digest the intelligence of these levels. And each level is very intelligent and they do support, they do support the, the, the following levels.
exactly yeah. otherwise there is a hole uh, and uh, yeah so how does it go on now do you stop with the warrior no no it goes on it so the warrior um the warrior is framed by the question uh you know what is true and what is false but if we were to go beyond um that next that next uh, level the way i would map that out would be the the level of the, this next level would be the question of whether or not is it whole or is it, is it, uh, is it some level separated? Am I dealing with the whole system or have I left some parts of the system out? Is it, is it, is it complete? Is it whole or is it fundamentally on a certain level de, uh, disenfranchised, somehow separated or, uh, um, uh, incomplete and that level because as you move into from the from the desire to see what's true and false you start to look at okay what's what's the biggest picture that I can come into contact with the biggest picture is a picture that I recognize everything that's in the picture if I'm going to connect with life and I'm, I'm going to appreciate life as a from a systemic perspective and this is where the systemic perspective comes in is it is it am i including everything or have i left something out and um am i integrated or is there part of the system which is still disintegrated or in some level marginalized and that's an important level to to access and this is the level that i would call the the integrator or the healer and um, and that question of the healer or the integrator is 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 it whole or is it incomplete? And that's the that's a very important question to to look at. And if it's whole, if it's whole, then then the 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 integrator or the healer can is 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 able to function from a systemic perspective. If it's incomplete the integrator, the healer recognizes, I don't have, uh, on some level I'm, I'm in, a, in a dualistic or in a somehow separated state from my environment and that limits my capacity to respond, that limits my capacity to include, it limits the capacity for the system to access all the different levels of its intelligence. And, and that's a very important level to, that for me that's, then the phase that comes after the warrior. And the, the final circle that I have mapped out, and I don't necessarily say it's the final circle, but it's the final circle that I have mapped out, is the, so is the level of what I would call the evolver. Is that somebody who is at, a, at that point in time, who is, is, they've come to touch with the capacity to, to see for themselves, to discern for themselves. They've come into touch with the need to, to integrate and include the whole system in the question. Now the question is, is the system uh, evolving? Is it moving in a life-affirming fashion that's, 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 that's emerging into its next form of development in the appropriate way. And evolution requires, the capacity to evolve requires um, a recognition that you're moving into the unknown because it's not, it's not a repetition of old forms. It's a, it's a movement into, uh, into new territory. It's taking the whole system and allowing it to evolve into, into a new form, into a, into a, a new synthesis of itself. And this is where birth comes in, into play. A birth of a new form of life, a birth of a new form of consciousness, a birth of a new form of, of, um, of functioning. And, and that's, that's that, that end where um, the recognition of, of a spiritual awakening of I am one with all things, then has space for that spiritual recognition to manifest in in a 
in, in an integrated state. If the integration hasn't happened, then you may get manifestation, uh, an evolutionary manifestation in only part of the system. Mm -hmm. And the other part of the system has not been included. So you're going to have a, you're going to have a, a, a dysfunctional state as part of the system wants to evolve. Another part of the system still has needs which haven't been addressed. And until the integration is complete, evolution will not be, will not be fundamentally um, capable of taking the whole system into the next phase of itself. Mm -hmm. Why integration is very important in the integral relationship with yourself is, in my perspective, priority um, uh, to a movement towards an evolving nature of self so that the system, if we talk about the individual, that the whole system is included in that movement of evolution. And it's not just the mind and the body's left behind, or it's not just the mind and the heart is left behind, or it's not just the mind and the shadow is left behind, but that the whole, in the, the entirety of the system is included in that evolutionary impulse. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, totally. Yeah. Uh, so what I understood when you said the evolution requires the capacity to evolve because it's movement into new territory. I was okay. thinking, is this the first stage where we can consciously uh, evolve? Does it imply that the previous days we, we, we just were pushed somehow or not pushed <laughs> and stayed where, wherever we stayed without mm -hmm. our active collaboration? I think that's, that's, a, that's probably true. I think to a large extent, until you get out of the, the soldier realm, what you're going to be doing is repeating the, the, the good ideas of the past. You're going to be repeating what is considered to be right. You're going to be repeating uh, successful scenarios that you consider, okay, I, how do I want my future to be? I would like it to be A, B, and C. And that is a developmental process and you can, you can see where you're going. Um, but e evolving requires a recognition that you want to move into territory that is yet to be discovered yet to be lived. And if you're moving into territory that is yet to be lived or yet to be expressed, you have to, you have to recognize that you don't know what that's going to look like. So you have to do, uh, you have to align with the direction of evolution without projecting what the future is supposed to look like according to your ideas. And that's a very difficult thing for the mind to do. Absolutely. It, yeah. And we want to have security and perspective and imagine where we want to go and then we go there. Right. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, the, and even in the imagination, if, the, if, the, if, if you can suspend the need, the need to know, there can be part of that imagination that emerges that comes up with something that's never been realized will be part of the evolutionary impulse. So imagination can function. It's just that we're not repeating the past. We're moving in, we're, we recognize we can't get there by repeating the past. We have to fundamentally take a risk. And, and based on, if we've got all of these other things aligned, if we've integrated and, we've, and, we're, and, we're, and, we're, and we're relying on our own, our own capacity to see the moment directly, and we have digested the, the difference between right and wrong and the cultural intelligence that, ex that, that created that, as well as understanding the, the nature of winning and losing, and fundamentally also understanding the needs to survive, then it's, it, it, we have a structure that's supportive of our capacity to move into the next moment and potentially uh, evolve. And if we can go back even, even, even more so, to take that larger perspective, and to descend and to take that evolutionary perspective and descend back into the integral perspective and then to descend back into the, the, the soldier, the warrior perspective, and then drop that into the soldier and drop that into the, into the, into the fighter and then bring that back down into, into the level of the survivor because there's a lot of intelligence at the level of the, of the survivor that we fail to access, especially with, you know, with questions like climate change, this is a survival question. This isn't just a question of how we want to live. This is a question of whether we will live or not. So if we don't fundamentally include the intelligence of the survivor, 
with that larger context that has been informed by the perspectives of evolution and integration and truth, we will continue to deal with this crisis at the level of a philosophical discussion, at the level of a cultural discussion, at the level of a discussion that, that, that doesn't fundamentally address really the essential needs of the system surviving into the next phase of itself. So all of these levels that I've mentioned are, are support the other, but the others need to, the, the top level needs to fundamentally access the intelligence of all the other levels in order to function in a complete way. And at least that's from my perspective, what seems to, what seems to be necessary. Yeah, it makes very, very, very much sense uh, to me. And uh, with that, I also want to address that normally we uh, integralists, mm. we are very integral, but whoever has a full practice as you have, mm. I see that often the body is completely neglected. Yeah. And when you do Ayakido, that's not only body, but it's also aesthetics, as you yeah. said. And I, I love these people, I say black skirts, I don't, I know they are not black skirts, but <laughs> it, it, it looks like, you know, like a dance. It's yes. wonderful for, for watching. And mm. also it builds your mind because you become, I never reach these levels. And mm. if there, it has been more uh, um, common and nearby, I would have continued, but mm. I had to go too far away, mm. travel uh, for two hours. It's just, Mm -hmm. was not doable but yeah. for me it's really an ideal way of approaching life mm. uh, because it includes so many uh, capacities which you build mm. automatically by practicing mm. 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 and you are not so separated as we are in school we learn this and maybe we do some sport but it's maybe only an hour the, the week mm. you know and it's not the sport which you learn there is separate from yeah. everything else. While in yeah. Aikido, I found that it's so connected also with your soul, also with your psyche, because yeah. you see how you are challenged. I, I started when I was quite old and, you know, I felt amongst all the young people, I felt like, oh, awkward, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you get your shadow thing uh, going sure. too. And, yeah. and many, many levels, which you can address when you, when you do that. And so, I'm really happy that out of that you create this um, system and that you also stress so much that it needs the, the I don't want to say oneness in this uh, case, but the unification of, of our fundamental uh, features of human, yes. you yeah. know? In terms, uh, of, in terms of the integration of, of, of our system, our, our, our body intelligence, our, our emotional intelligence, our, our cognitive intelligence, and and our relational intelligence, because that's Aikido where it functions in a tremendous way, is the the access of that the relationship actually has a certain intelligence. That that's the the image that I use is a husband and a wife, and the relationship is the marriage, mm -hmm. and that marriage has a fundamental intelligence about it as well. And to be able to access not only my own independent, um, my own independent needs, and the integration of that, right? Already, there's a separation between mind and body, or a separation between mind and heart. So the integration of that at the individual level, and then the recognition that I also exist. Not only do I exist as an I, I exist as a body, I exist as a heart, I exist as a mind, I exist as an I, but I also exist as a we. I exist as a we between you and I. There's a we, and that we is part of who I am as well. And that we also resonates at these different levels, you know, physically, emotionally, and cognitively, and in all of the different dimensions that are still part of that system, uh, shattered dimensions or unconscious dimensions as well. And so the capacity to, to come into touch with the different dimensions that we exist in to come into touch with the different dimensions that, that we share, and then to align with a process that brings us into new territory, that brings us into, into more authentic expressions of ourselves, and to stimulate these, these things. That's exactly what Aikido potentially can be. It's not always practiced in that way, but it, it can potentially be. And, and of course, you don't have to practice Aikido to access what I'm talking about either. 
through just simply being a human being and being able to integrate your perspective and allow and open to the different levels of yourself and to recognize that and to function at those different levels and then to include that in the collective sense stimulates the process that we've been sharing in, in this last hour. So, Sure, but Aikido is helping to prepare yes, the ground absolutely. and can has potentially more potential than only sitting yeah. on the cushion, you know, yeah. but that it's more more inclusive. Yes. Yeah. And that's what the world needs today. People yes. who are able to, to access all the intelligences and not mm -hmm. only know them in their mm -hmm. mind, but, right. but have them and operate from them. Right. So let me, finish, let me finish one last thing real quickly, because at that level of evolution, the, the changes, the relationship directly with conflict can change. And this is the, uh, just a short map. But at the initial point of conflict, conflict is a threat. If we can go beyond that and see that as we evolve, conflict then becomes a problem. From the problem stage, it moves into conflict is a challenge. And then from the challenge stage, conflict is an opportunity. Then from, from the opportunity stage, conflict then becomes a source. Itself is a source of, 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 of a catalyst. It's a catalyst for growth. So it's, it's our relationship to these things where we see it's the same, same event, but when we see it, if we see it as a threat, it's very different than if we see it as a catalyst for growth. And beyond catalyst for growth, it becomes a source of wisdom, a literally a source of wisdom itself. Now, if we can move from threat to a source of wisdom, if we can see something, for example, as climate change, moving from climate change as being a threat to as a source of, of the fundamental intelligence that we need in order to evolve, we actually look for what's happening in the system as the source of the energy that we need in order to evolve, then it's not something to, to attack, it's something to embrace as a way to find the solution in relationship to it. And that's where I find the, you know, the, the movement of our identity in relationship to conflict actually changes the way we see conflict itself. That makes super sense. And um, last question, I would ask you, do you see any of this appearing in the public discourse already? Or? I, I see a tremendous number, of, I see a tremendous number of, of systemic approaches. I see a lot of people who are... Who are um, are opening up to larger perspectives and approaching these questions from from these from these more integral or evolutionary uh, impulses, but I still see a, a tendency, the human tendency, to create um, another group as being the problem. And even in the larger, you know, the social inequality narrative of, okay, it's the 1% that's the problem. It's the, you know, it's, it's always somebody else who is the problem, whether, you know, even in the larger social, social justice circles, there's always this tendency to want to identify it's the racist, it's the misogynist, it's the this, it's the, it's the capitalist. And there is that tendency to do that. And I understand that tendency. But in the end, as you get to an integral perspective, you go, no, this is just life, all trying to figure itself out. And, and it doesn't mean we don't have a lot to do. We do have a lot to do. And we have to embrace a tremendous amount. But as long as we create any, any, anyone else as being the fundamental source of that problem, we create division and we get stuck back into the old paradigms. And we, even if we have good intentions, as long as we're holding on to those old paradigms, it keeps us kind of anchored in that, in that, in that paradigm. So we need to let go of those old paradigms, the need to have an enemy, the need to identify uh, some group or some, some aspect as being the, 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 the problem and move to a, an embracing of the totality and still live at each level, still address conflict at the survival level, still recognize conflict can be a threat. If a person's pointing a gun at you, that's a threat. 
It's not to imagine it's a source of wisdom. It is a threat, but it also, in this very moment, can be a source of a tremendous recognition of what, the, what is going on. It, can be, it is both, but we, it's, so it's not a movement away from the very visceral challenges we have in terms of survival. It's an inclusion of these larger uh, questions that we want to have so that we can not only just survive, we can evolve as we survive. Yeah, absolutely. And so it comes back to what I always thought the problems, the solution of the problems we have now is, lies in d development and yeah. solution yeah. of the individuals and of, of us of growing up and getting a bigger perspective and yeah. um, letting go this need of fight against somebody or something, uh, but, but co come to creative and constructive ideas and solutions. Yeah. 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 So we are at the end, I think, and it was yeah. really, very, very enlightening to talk to you. And I thank you very much. And I really appreciate the moment and and the chance to be able to share this with you. It's a, it's a, um, um, I feel very, very close to my heart, and I'm, and I have, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to. Would to you like to, to share your your website and your information? Uh, Sure, you can get a hold of, of me or, or come into contact with, with our work here at um, evolutionaryaikido.com uh, or aikidomontro.com, both websites come back to me. I also work in uh, conflict resolution with regards to psychiatric uh, hospitals with regards between caregivers, nurses, doctors, and their patients, which is a systemic approach in terms of dealing with the relation, resolving conflict, uh, which can be sometimes very physical and aggressive within the context of the healing relationship or the caregiving relationship. And so that work um, is done through, um, through another uh, extension of, of our work called the Conscious Practice Institute. So that is also a website you can contact consciouspracticeinstitute.com and um, but any one of those uh, uh, are an avenue of connecting with me or connecting with the work that we do. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much and All right. embrace yes. the possibilities which yes. you have heard. <laughs> I'd yes. say that to our audience and okay. come back, connect with uh, Patrick and thank you. All right. Thank so you. Thank you very much.